Imagine trying to maintain and operate power transmission lines in those extreme weather conditions. That's what faced the officials and 18,000 residents of Juneau, Alaska. For two years, they fought a losing battle. This is the story of how government and private business combined to bring power to Juneau in a race against winter. Juno is a city that pioneers carved into the base of the mountainous terrain of southeastern Alaska. The splendor of the governor's mansion gives few clues to the rugged nature of this area, nor does the Alaska State Capitol building. You do begin to feel its brawling past with the first sight of the famed Red Dog Saloon, where gold seekers let off some steam. Juno was the site of the first Alaskan gold strike in 1880. That brought a flood of tough men ready to battle the Alaska elements in search of quick fortunes. Miners and the rest of the residents had to contend with an environment that includes Mendenhall Glacier just outside Juneau. It's part of 1,500 square miles of ice fields in the mountainous region of southeastern Alaska. The problem Juneau residents faced in the 1970s was a power shortage in an area dependent on electricity. It wasn't a lack of power generation. This unique underground Snedisham hydroelectric plant was completed in 1973. From the air, you can only see the entryways. Located 28 miles southeast of Juneau, Snedisham is reached only by air or water, and service vehicles like this pickup have to be barged to the power plant. Built by the Army Corps of Engineers, the powerhouse is encased within a chamber of solid rock a feat for which the Engineering Corps received a Distinguished Design Award. Plenty of power is available. These turbines and generators produce enough electricity to meet the requirements of Juno now and in the foreseeable future. Underground tunnels bring the water needed to activate the plant's generators. The power is transmitted to Juno through 40 miles of overhead conductors plus a short section of submarine cable crossing Taku Inlet. Juno's power problem was here, on a ridge often raked by snow, ice, and winds fierce enough to freeze a polar bear, Salisbury Ridge. Just four months after the power lines from Snedisham to Juno were activated, the ice and 200 mile an hour winds proved too much. One of the towers collapsed. That was in January of 1974. Within a week, two more towers went down. Electricity from the new power plant to Juneau was interrupted for the rest of the winter. Even a temporary solution failed. In the summer of 74, a series of wood poles were installed on the ridge. The line span between them was shortened, and each pole was anchored with a dozen guy wires in an attempt to beat this weather monster ridge. Snedisham power was restored to Juneau in October of 1974. It was no good. That winter, a howling gale made pretzels of several wooden poles. The Alaskan winter had won again. From November of 74 through March of 1975, Juneau suffered through 28 power outages, and the decision was made. The Salisbury Ridge transmission lines would have to be relocated low on the ridge where there would be protection from those vicious winds. The area would have to be logged, the towers set, and the conductors strung, all within Juno's short construction season. Many skeptics in the city shook their heads. The weather and the rugged terrain had broken more than one contractor who tried lesser feats. But Erickson Air Crane of Hillsboro, Oregon, accepted the challenge. Erickson had extensive experience in aerial logging and power line construction. And they had the Sky Crane, which was to become the unquestioned star of the Juno job. As the drama unfolded, it became obvious. Without the Sky Crane, finishing the job on time would have been impossible. No other piece of equipment could have handled it. Curious TV cameramen and reporters are on hand as the Sikorsky S-64 lands in Seattle on the first leg of its journey to Alaska. 
After flying from Hillsboro, the Sky Crane is loaded onto a barge for the water leg of the trip to Alaska. The size of the giant copter is best illustrated in relation to the men working around it. TV cameramen and reporters are replaced by Snowflakes and Longshoremen for the Sky Crane's arrival in Juneau, March 30th. The Alaskan winter is dying hard, but already we are assembling the equipment and men necessary to win this desperate race against winter. The Sky Crane's initial job will be the logging of the power line right of way. How long will this city be the Sky Crane's new home? That will depend on the ability of the construction crews to solve the problems ahead. To protect the environment, no roads could be built to the new transmission line right of way. So Ericsson based its entire operation on helicopters. A local firm is used to transport 100 men to and from the job site each day. There is no other way to accomplish the construction task but by helicopter. The battle against time began on April 8th when the first tree was cut. A job with this many elements might have defeated a contractor with less experience. Timber from the Tongass National Forest was purchased by Ericsson and sold to Alaska Lumber and Pulp Mill in Sitka. Working against a deadline, the cutters soon created a swath of downed trees. But again, to protect the environment, those trees had to be removed. The only way to log this forest is by helicopter, and only the Sky Crane could have done it within the allotted time. We have to get those trees cut and hauled away in two months, or we'll never complete the transmission line job in one Alaskan work season. Men on the ground have to hustle to keep up with the Sky Crane. Over 1,000 chokers are needed by the ground crews to keep pace with the speed of the giant helicopter. Okay, 6-5, I'm clear. The ground crew rigged those loads with the skill that only experience can bring, taking advantage of every pound in the tremendous 10-ton lifting capacity of the Sky Crane. Size 15, 16, 17, line 18. On the previous transmission line, the cut timber had been left where it fell, a terrible waste of natural resources. On this job, the Sky Crane will remove over four million board feet of timber from the six-mile power line right-of-way. The impassable terrain demanded a water-based logging operation. Booms were set up in Gastineau Channel, where the logs would be prepared for transportation to Sitka. The trees are actually processed at this floating facility. It includes two barges on which logs are lifted, limbed, graded, and banded into bundles. The bundles are dumped into log booms awaiting transportation to the mill, a 90-mile tugboat tow. The tight time schedule requires the overlapping of every phase of the project. Equipment is brought in for the start of tower work, even as logging continues. Ericsson crews begin excavation for the leveling pads for each tower leg on April 16th. The excavations have to be all the way down to bedrock for maximum strength. Each tower needs four of these footing excavations. The rebars are in place ready for the aerial concrete pour. Ericsson supervisors have to coordinate the efforts of other firms, including the Juno concrete supplier, to be sure every step is done on schedule. Like everything else, the concrete has to be transported to the site by air. This loaded concrete bucket weighs over 16,000 pounds, which means another job for the ever-busy sky crane. <laughs> 